Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to the October SAAA meeting. Obviously, this is a Zoom meeting, and uh, we will also have a Zoom meeting in November. Uh, have no fear, though, the Christmas party will be live, and it's scheduled right now for the 14th of December, and uh, we're planning to have it in the Lambia House, as we normally do. And the starting in 2022, we will uh, start our live sessions, hopefully, again, using the uh, the flag realm. We do have an event in October. We had mentioned that at the last meeting. It's pretty well firmed up now. So let me just give you the details. Uh, the event is the 29th of October. And uh, we've arranged for a tour of the St. Francis Barracks and the National Cemetery, which is next door to it. Uh, we plan to assemble in front of the building, front of the headquarters building at uh, 2.30. They'll call it 14.30, but for the civilians, it's 2.30. As far as parking goes, uh, there's a huge lot in front of the building. If there's any spaces that are not reserved, you're free to use them. There's also a lot behind the uh, St. Francis Barracks. And as long as it's, it's not... Um, Mark reserved for this or reserved for that, you're free to use it. Uh, there'll be no mask required. You can wear them, it's your option if you want. Uh, the only thing we ask is you bring some sort of ID. They may want to see something when you enter the building. Uh, the tour should end about uh, four o'clock, 1600. And uh, just to the left of the entrance to the uh, to the headquarters is the door for the officers club. If uh, that's open, there's a garden, and uh, we will have a toast at uh, four o'clock in the the garden, just outside the officers club, for the 35th anniversary of uh, SAAA. Uh, if people can't for some reason attend the tour. Uh, they can just come at four for the toast. And after the toast, the officers club is open and you're free to visit it. And that would be probably, you know, 4.15ish. I think they close down at 5.30. Uh, we have a limit of 30 people. It's gonna be on a first come, first serve basis. Uh, anyone over, the, over that 30 limit will put on a waiting list. And if there's a big enough demand, we'll attempt to uh, to run another tour at a later date. And I see Robbie's on. Robbie, can you fill us in on how we're going to handle the reservations? Sure. Um, just shoot me an email. And I'll probably just kind of do it on a first come, first serve basis. If you just want to send me an email with um, who's coming, you know, how many people will be in your party, and I'll just start tallying a total. And once we meet our limit, I'll start a wait list. So I'm just gonna put my email in the chat. And so check your calendars and shoot me an email if you um, wanna make it. Yeah, and if you if you email Robbie, she'll just reply to you that you're, you're good to go or you're on a waiting list. Exactly. Yeah, that whole, uh, the, the whole thing will also be uh, sent to all the members. It, it is a member only event. And uh, we'll get the message out to everybody. And, uh, you know, if you miss something, the email address or the details, uh, it'll be on a, a, an email that you'll receive. Does anyone have any questions on that before we move along? Okay, sounds good to me. Uh, let me go to a uh, famous, can you name the artifact? Hmm. Some of us, I think, know what this is, but I'll leave that on for a couple of minutes just to uh, for the people who want to investigate what this is. I see some smiling faces. I think some people know what this is. And at the uh, at the end of the talk, we'll uh, we'll see who has the right answer. Okay, we're good to go. 
let, let's get on to uh, our guest speaker, who is Dr. Uzi Baram. He's an anthropologist and has done exclusive research in both the Mediterranean, uh, Northeast America, and Florida. He's currently a professor at the New College of Florida, which is in Sarasota, New York. Uh, New York. I'm a New Yorker, obviously. Florida. I just I just flew down from New York yesterday, by the way. Uh, he's been there since 1995. In addition to teaching, he's also the director of the archaeological lab. So with that, without further ado, let me turn it over to uh, Uzi. It's all yours. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, not very much, not, uh, not in New York or here in Florida. <laughs> I, I want to start with inspiration, uh, the inspiration for the project you'll be hearing about. And although I wasn't able to come to St. Augustine uh, for this presentation, uh, the invitation did uh, allow me to remember a little bit, reminisce from about a dozen years ago when my kids were young and I took them to St. Augustine and then over to Fort Musé and to see the location of Fort Musé from the boardwalk to go into the exhibits in the visitor center. And of course, really thinking hard about what the Kathleen Deegan uh, was able to do with that project also long ago. Uh, I've said this in several public presentations over the years, uh, and I like reminiscing on it. As a young grad student visiting my parents in Boca Raton, I drove up to St. Augustine one day and saw someone excavating, went over, and they got out of the excavation unit started telling me what was going on. And I was so impressed with that, just respect for a random person coming. I knew who she was, uh, but I was a, a grad student doesn't very much no one. And she just showed tremendous kindness and sharp intellect. Well, Fort Mose is actually really important for this presentation, not just for reminiscences uh, about my family or uh, inspiration. It's part of a larger history for African Florida, the movement of people that starts with uh, Fort Mose will move down the Florida Gulf Coast to a southern part of Tampa Bay, the south side of the Manatee River, where the flame of liberty and the fight against slavery continued into the early 19th century. This is the land of the Seminole Miccosukee peoples and the ancestors. And this work is just part of a much larger project to disseminate the history of the region in recognizing the struggles and achievements over the centuries, much of which has been built over, uh, but hopefully not forgotten. We're going to this region. Uh, you see here, Florida, then Tampa Bay, and then the Manatee River shown in the bottom right. Uh, as you heard, I'm Uzi Baram, and it's really an honor that I've been able to work on a project looking for Angola on the Manatee River for a decade and a half with some really incredible scholars and dedicated community members. Uh, though you're gonna hear my voice uh, during this presentation, I uh, hope you realize it's part of a very uh, long-term collaborative uh, uh, effort, both with scholars and community members. And this presentation, as the title uh, shows, is about a history no longer silenced. I'm gonna share with you for the evenings out uh, what we found during recent excavations in January 2020, and what we're finding out about this community. I, I will start with, well, that it was almost lost. That at the start, at the end of the 20th century, when I first got to Sarasota for the job at New College of Florida, I'd heard what I can best describe as a legend that there was this place in the region where formerly enslaved uh, Africans, people who self-emancipated, were able to find freedom. But more was unknown than was known about this community. And it really is just a tremendous amount of luck or the spirit of ancestors or just great dedication that allowed us to do what you're here before the night's over. Uh, as far as I know, except for a lot, excuse, that's my Siamese cat who likes joining in on conversations and he won't stop. Uh, I've I didn't meet Dewey Dye, I never knew the man, but in the archives 
of uh, Manatee Public Library was a speech he gave in 1973, where he detailed the history of the peoples of the region, including his interpretation of an archival scrap, basically, that he recognized belonged to Angola, a community of uh, what he referred to as escaped slaves. In 1990, in conversations with Dewey Dye and his own research, Kenta Brown Jr., then at the Tampa Bay History Center, pulled together some materials for a 1990 article in Tampa Bay history on Sarasota or the runaway Negro plantation, Tampa Bay's first black community. Uh, he found this other term, we decided uh, Angola was the one to do. And actually when I say we, it's the person you see in the top right. Uh, Dewey Dye shared his information with people in Bradenton. Cantor Brown shared it with the academic community in you know, what I would say was a regional journal. It was Vicki Oldham, then a reporter, who recognized the power of this story. And she knew it was crucial, kind of a felt sense of it. She wasn't trained in archeology span or history, but she knew there was something about what Cantor Brown had been writing about, about that legend about this community that was really important. We had so little to go on though when she first approached me in 2004. The materials that Dewey Dye had seen was from the lands grants, as I think many of you know, uh, after the United States gained La Florida from Spain, uh, there was a need to change the land property uh, documents. And there were land claims and a commission. Uh, a Cuban fisher folk, the Caldez brothers, made a claim for land, as you can see here on the slide, for Angola on the Oyster River. Uh, you can see it again with both names uh, on the other list. Uh, it was rejected. And in fact, it was rejected because these Cuban fisher folk did not uh, have land on the Manatee River and the Oyster River. Uh, it belonged to others, but they were hoping to get it and they were denied. But this is where we get the name Angola. We assume the Caldez family were in connected with the Maroons, with the self-emancipated people of African heritage who are living on the Oyster River and they carried forward that name. Uh, the map that you see comes from John Lee Williams and just, and it's hard to see in the small image, but the old Spanish fields, uh, the Americans recognized there had been something going on there during the Spanish times, but this was mostly it. Uh, we had a big area to look at. Uh, the Oyster River is clearly the Manatee River, the southern part of Tampa Bay. And there were several places where there were just intriguing finds. Uh, in the bottom near the Braden Castle uh, was a fire back with an image of a Danish king uh, by the Manatee Mineral Springs, uh, Manatee Mineral Spring, which you see in the top, uh, a bayonet from 1818 from the Tabby House ruins at DeSoto National Memorial, ceramics that dated to the early 19th century. Uh, it was just so intriguing that maybe there was something there, but where was it? Was it underwater? Was it on land? Well, the good news, and we can go fairly quickly, uh, is we were able to find some evidence. Uh, the project started, uh, that Vicki Oldham organized, uh, was looking for Angola, and we started in 2005 with a kickoff event at New College of Florida, where we laid out the search for this legendary place. From the beginning, the goal of this public archaeology, now they are referred to it as uh, community-based archaeology, was to engage community members. If you look at that flyer at the bottom, you see there's a dozen presentations that were given, trying to find out what people in the community knew, what people across Sarasota and Manatee might have known. Uh, the arrow goes from basically 2005 to 2014. I can assure you it was a difficult nine years, uh, but during those years, we're able to find some evidence that let us state that by the Manatee Mineral Spring on the south side of the Manatee River, there was evidence, archeological evidence for this early 19th century maroon community. Uh, working with my community partners, we created heritage interpretation signs in 2016, some digital reconstructions, uh, 2019, the National Park Service recognized the work and put it on the Network to Freedom. 
and descendants came and danced on the ground where their ancestors had been in 2018 and 2019. Uh, really just a wonderful example of the strength and success of community-based archaeology. The work though in the Brayton Herald headline uh, was really mine. You can see those little green uh, rectangles. Uh, that's where I led volunteer efforts. Time Sifters Archaeological Society, a uh, member of the Florida Anthropological Society, brought volunteers, new college students came, and over several weekends, over several years, we uh, excavated and found those uh, remains. We have seen the map on the top is the Manatee River. The little blue by 14th Street East is the Manatee Mineral Spring, a source of fresh water. That work was good enough that the National Park Service recognized it and uh, literally was put on the map. So we were able to say, that, yes, it was there and you can go and get your stamp as part of all of this. Well, the local community was actually really excited by all this work and particularly the Network to Freedom recognition. And part of the dynamic led the city of Bradenton to call for an extension of Riverwalk, its highly successful entertainment district, to the Manatee Mineral Spring. And this was you know, greeted in the local newspapers with lots of celebration. And as an archaeologist, of course, I went into near panic because if they were going to build, and you can see the plans there, uh, lagoons and a pond and all the kind of construction, what would happen to the archaeological record? I just excavated just a little bit. Uh, assuming the park would be there forever. Uh, well, the community-based archaeology uh, actually worked out really well. Uh, thanks to discussions with Miriam Omi and uh, Judy Bentz, who provide the strategy, we're able to marshal that community support and got the city of Bradenton to fund excavations in January 2020. It's a real plug to always include community members, make sure the grassroots knows what you're doing and how you're doing it. Because for us, it really was uh, helped us save Angola in many ways. And so I can share with you a little bit of uh, what we had. And here are just some views of the excavations and the lab work. I want to get into it, but I need to explain what we had. And for that, I again, step back. So the first part of the talk, that public support, that public outreach in the community, uh, grassroots support that led to the excavations. Well, we needed to think, I wanted to give you a sense of where this all fits into the larger picture. Uh, I often think about Audre Lorde, uh, the famous black feminist, right? For people enslaved in the Anglo colonies in the United States, uh, one of the ways to overthrow enslavement was flight, was escape, that there was very low chance of creating a new life within the slave regime. And so they came to Spanish La Florida, the southern route of the Underground Railroad. And the map shows that, the first, of course, being Fort Merce. But then after the British period and the return of Spanish rule, uh, it moves to the Gulf Coast. And that's the key for this presentation. It's the key for understanding the archaeological evidence from Angola. At Fort Merze, as uh, you all here in St. Augustine are more than aware, uh, we have those two pulses of habitation uh, that were excavated by Kathy Deegan and of course, Laura Lee and uh, Davison have been excavating there, providing even more insights into this community. And then we moved to the Gulf Coast. During the War of 1812, uh, otherwise known as the Napoleonic Wars in Europe, uh, the Spanish controlled Florida, but barely. The British, in their fight against the United States, supported Native Americans and Maroons. Part of that support was at the Apalachicola River, one of the major rivers for the farmers of Georgia and what's now Alabama, as you can see in the map, in terms of uh, bringing things by water down to the Gulf of Mexico. And the British built, engineered rather, a gigantic fort on the site of Prospect Bluff overlooking the Apalachicola River. Uh, again, these are my kids flying scale for the area that's today just grass. 
we know a tremendous amount about this history uh, because it was a major international event. In July of 1816, though more than 200 years ago, uh, as the US uh, beat the British at the Battle of New Orleans, uh, Andrew Jackson sent the US Navy up the Appalachicola to attack this fort, which he rightly understood as a threat to the slave regime. Hundreds of Native Americans and Maroons were at the fort and up and down the river as agriculturalists. Uh, from the US Navy records, it's very clear they had a lucky shot. They blew up the magazine and 300 of the defenders of the fort were killed. Hundreds were captured, but many escaped. We have a map of that fort that got renamed Fort Gladson uh, after Andrew Jackson's aid. And a sense of that fort, uh, there was excavations in 1968 at that location and more recently after some hurricanes came by. And with the help of Digital Heritage Interaction and the Florida Humanities Council that funded the work, we have what the Fort Five looked like. And I like this digital reconstruction because it gives a sense of just how big this was, how powerful. As we think about this history of African peoples in Florida, really think large scale. And these people understood themselves as British that they were promised that they fought under the British flag, they would be considered British subjects, and they were promised uh, by Edward Nichols, that of the British army, that they would be granted land to live in freedom if they, uh, as part of this endeavor. And so this is, becomes a really important part of the understanding of these people, that they were Maroons, people of African heritage, and they were closely connected with the British and they saw themselves as British subjects particularly in the fight for freedom. That battle at Prospect Bluff, of course, destroyed the fort. Uh, people were captured, people were killed. Uh, the survivors fled southward to Swanee, the Swanee River, where Billy Bowlegs and uh, Seminoles had a community and they welcomed these Maroons. Again, we have a sketch map for the community and what you can see is a kind of nucleated area for Bowlegs Town, this camp, and then little dots that are referred to as, as towns, probably just little hamlets where families had some crops, some animals, and tried to create uh, a life for themselves in freedom and liberty. Uh, we have this map, uh, sadly, because Andrew Jackson recognized that these were the people who had escaped from Prospect Bluff. These are trained soldiers willing to fight for their freedom. And so he came down with his Tennessee volunteers and attacked in what's known as the Battle of Swanee. And again, from US military records, uh, we're quite clear that the warriors held off the American soldiers and that the vast majority escaped. When we get back to Gladson, again, the aide to Andrew Jackson, and he writes, and this is just one of the quotes, that they escaped to Tampa Bay, the fable point for communications with Spanish and European emissaries. Uh, the Americans recognize that these Maroons were part of the Atlantic world, part of international intrigues with Spain, with uh, Great Britain and others in that fight for freedom. Well, we were able, thanks to the work that was completed in 2014, to say, yes, this was the spot uh, where part of Angola was. It wasn't the entirety of the community, uh, but there were two components that were really important. Uh, one, we recognized there was a dispersed community, again, following the model that we see at Swanee, and what we understood as people living up and down the Apalachicola River. They had gone through two traumas, uh, one at Prospect Bluff, one at Swanee. And so they were not living in a nucleated area. They were trying to hide from slave raiders, from American troops. And so they would have been dispersed over a fairly large area. But one of those areas was the Manatee Mineral Spring. And a nonprofit historic preservation organization, which had invited me to do excavations in 2008, 2009, 2013, uh, welcomed us back. 
Uh, they were able to work with the city of Bradenton to provide the space to do the work there. And what we're looking for, and this we didn't realize when we started the project, was British mass produced goods, because that's how these people saw themselves as British subjects. And with the help of historical archaeological research over the decades, we had really fine grained chronological possibilities for recovering ceramics and dating them to pretty much within decades. And so we started with this empty field that was a result of decades of occupation. One of the reasons that I'd done small scale excavations earlier was that the surface area in the 21st century was covering so, so much more that we needed to excavate a tremendous amount. Here's the area by the Manatee River that we opened up, the even larger area by the Manatee Mineral Spring. Uh, you can see buckets and a couple of people to give you a sense of scale of how much we opened up in order to find evidence, uh, thanks to Laura, Laura Harrison, uh, a nice 3D image. Uh, I think the ghostly image is quite nice for a sense of the scale of things. We had to go through, obviously, the surface, but this area was important after the Maroons. We know it was important before the Maroons, uh, that there was a Native American, a pre-Columbian Native American village and mound that was identified in the 1930s. The mound was long destroyed by the time we get to the 21st century. Then came the Maroons. After them, two decades later, Anglo-Americans started settling the region in the 1840s. That initial settlement by the Manatee Mineral Spring, what was known as the village of Manatee, was highly successful and grew and grew until it became part of the city of Bradenton. And then ultimately it became a park. And so what you see in the stratigraphy, and particularly for all of you who really love stratigraphy, of course, is the ground surface, the 21st century material, late 20th century material, uh, late 19th century, uh, mid 19th century, and then just way at the bottom in what is a discontinuous, uh, level, but very clearly visible across much of the area is the early 19th century associated with the Angola community. So we opened up all that land so that we get down to it. We're still working and we'll continue work on the other 19th century and 20th century materials. But for now, in this talk is really about the Angola uh, community. And we found a lot. And that's what I'll share with you as we get to this part of the, the presentation. Uh, we located, as we were working through the layers, uh, lots of post molds. And from the lower levels, uh, some of them are really interesting. Uh, we know that these people built and lived in cabins and wooden cabins. And in fact, we can see that this is a nice piece of a wooden cabin. We found a barrel well. And this still, frankly, uh, puzzles us. And I, I hope uh, people come up with ideas about this. We see on the right, uh, you see Sherry Speckus, who's my field director, uh, taking some photographs, uh, a wooden box. And then as we excavated through that, a uh, wooden barrel on either side of it. And you can see it in the stratigraphy uh, posts. And so this image uh, from uh, Hilton Head Island is probably a, a pretty good one for understanding this barrel well. Uh, a wooden structure with a way for a bucket to get down and pull up the fresh water. The reason this puzzles us, uh, this is about uh, 20 meters away from the Manti Mineral Spring. And the spring has always been a source of fresh water. People are still using it in the 20th century. So we're not quite sure why the Maroons would have built a barrel well so close to a source of fresh water. Uh, you, you can feel free to, to share your interpretations when we get to the, the question answer period. Uh, other parts of it, and the stratigraphy was complicated as, as you saw in earlier. Uh, at one point as we were excavating, uh, we realized that there were four post molds all at the same level. 
And so there's me and some of the crew standing where the post molds were. And so we spent uh, time being very careful as we excavated down through that. And as we got to the floor of that structure, there were two small pits, one next to the other. In one, this is the thing on the right, uh, was a small metal object that we refer to as the G-shaped belonging. Uh, it may have been an ornament, a clue to hold a, a, clo a cloak, uh, something like clothes together. Uh, we're not sure. The other one uh, is half of a glass projectile point. Uh, my colleague, Rosin Howard, who's been part of this project from the beginning, who did ethnographic work with descendants at Red Bays in the Bahamas, uh, interprets this through West African lenses. Uh, probably not surprising in an archaeological talk uh, to say it's ritual that these runes in this one structure create dug two small pits, and in one put this object, and in the other put that one. And they were left there until we came and excavated uh, a year ago. Uh, we, of course, found plentiful ceramics, uh, very few earthenwares, mostly pearlwares and other materials. The, they date, in terms of the story for the Angola period, uh, from the 1770s to 1820. Uh, and it seems like it's a pretty good uh, collection. The, the, the distribution stops at about 1820 and then starts up again with the 1840s when the Anglo-Americans came. Uh, Jean and Mary on the lab crew uh, just did a fantastic job of identifying the hundreds and hundreds of uh, ceramic shirts that we had recovered. Uh, this is another piece that was intriguing. And so the glass projectile point, uh, we actually found a good number of pieces of flake glass. This was mass produced glass from the time period, uh, but with what looks like really clear evidence of flaking. Uh, some of you might be aware that during the same time period at Seminole sites across Florida, there's a tradition of flake glass. And so this seems to be part of that. Uh, not necessarily that Seminoles are here, but that they, the Maroons did the same sort of technology for cutting and scraping using glass instead of stone. Of course, stone being almost uh, not impossible to find in this region. Uh, thanks to Diane Wallman at the University of South Florida, uh, we have the inventory of all the animal bones. We, we haven't uh, uh, done, gone through and associated them with the different levels. Uh, we do have lots of cow bones from the maroon levels, uh, pig, chicken uh, from other levels. And it's not terribly clear yet. Uh, some common animals like possums, like in fact, a, a complete possum burial, and, and other critters uh, that were on this site through the centuries. Uh, we're confident about the cattle uh, that was there, and we know from historical sources that these uh, maroons had cows. What was really, I would almost say fantastic, and what I've just really uh, helped me to explain this in public audiences in terms of thinking about the Maroons as real people was not so much uh, these creatures, but this find. If you can see in that circle is the stain from a wooden box, a rectangular box. When we came across it, and you can see water was a major problem as we we're excavating. Uh, the rising sea levels are quite visible in the aquifer in this region. Uh, since I started excavating, it, it's changed, uh, but we were able to get this work done. As we were moving that stain, we came across a complete dog skeleton that at this level, at the Angola level, someone had a dog, put him in a wooden box and buried him. Thanks to Diane Wallman, I can say it was about 18 inches high, uh, a little less than 50 pounds. And what she tells me is think about a border collie or Australian shepherd. I have a picture of a Carolina dog. It's just going to give a sense. And that piece of the history that we uncovered, I think really just gives us a sense of these people in a, a really wonderfully uh, a complex manner. Uh, being by the Manti River and near uh, Sarah, uh, Tampa Bay, of course, there was a lot of shell, a lot of fish, 
uh, crab, uh, the, the foods, uh, we have a very good sense of thanks to this work. Many of the objects we're able to identify. Uh, I sometimes feel like my career has been haunted by clay tobacco pipes, whether in the Middle East or here, uh, but we found them. And again, they date from the right time period for that matches the Angola history. And there are other times we found things that we're still not clear on. Uh, what looks like uh, metal netting, it's, these are little pieces of metal. Uh, they go down into the Angola level, but they seem to be mixed in with other levels as well. We're not quite sure uh, if they associate with lots of levels or had just been mixed up by taponomic processes. What we, again, if people have suggestions, I'm always uh, kind of excited to hear people's ideas. We're really not sure. We've checked with lots of you know, relevant sources and experts, no one's quite clear on using metal for netting, uh, at least for fishing, and maybe other possibilities that we just haven't thought about. But we're still ongoing. This process, as I think all of you are aware, uh, goes on for a while before we're able to really make sense of all the materials. We can kind of start pulling it together as a model for understanding. And this is really the change from the 2014 report where I could say, yes, Angola was part of uh, the Manatee Mineral Spring history. Here we can start talking about the daily life of the people. We know they use British mass produced goods, those pearlware dishes, those Kalen tobacco pipes, and so much more. They seem to have that seminal style glass flaking to make into sharp tools. We have not so much from the excavations, the uh, pollen analysis, uh, the conditions weren't ripe, but from other research I was able to do and work with the descendant community, we know there was a robust agricultural community with livestock and with the marine resources. And I've always made it clear that what we excavated was just one part of the Angola community. It's probably a key part. Uh, it's right on the river. It would have been a great lookout station to be concerned about American ships coming in, again, from the experience at the Apalachicola River and at Swanee, that would be a concern, but it was probably spread across the Manatee River and all the way down to Sarasota Bay, in fact, where New College of Florida is today. It's just most of that area has been built over and we're looking really for our small scale hamlets that we'd have to be pretty lucky to, to recover. But we're starting to get a sense of the ways of life of these people starting the 1770s with an increase of population in 1816, even larger increase in 1818. And this is again from uh, digital reconstructions. Uh, I'm gonna have to redo these because we have now more information, particularly about the animals, but with Digital Heritage Interactive, a sense of these wooden cabins, that seems to have played out really well from the wood we found with the spring leading to a small stream that goes into the Manatee River. Much of what we found was in fact from things that were thrown into that stream uh, from the other materials uh, work, uh, seminal pumpkins, corn, beans, as part of the agricultural materials. That pine tree that you see is something that was noted in 1840s. We actually know a lot more about the trees of the region, thanks to some support by uh, some botanists in looking at some of the evidence. So we're really kind of building up this landscape and coming closer to a real sense of these people. Now, part of this, and I've already kind of hinted at it, because uh, there is an end to this story of this history, and it came in 1821. Uh, Cantor Brown Jr. is the one who came up with the archival information, and probably one of the clearest uh, discussions comes from the Charlotte City Gazette and lays out what we are now understand even better than when Cantor started this work an attempt to what was considered at the time capture property. That as Spain handed over Florida to the United States, Andrew Jackson asked permission to invade and capture these uh, freedom seeking individuals. He was denied, but his close allies went in. And as the newspaper report lays out, they arrived at Sarasota, the other name for Angola, captured 300 of them plundered their plantation, that's just the archaic term for agricultural fields, set fire to all their houses, 
that was those cabins I mentioned, and then went further down into Charlotte Harbor as well. And I've always been chilled when I see that term, the terror that spread along the western coast of East Florida. Well, it did break those establishments. Some went into the interior of Florida and became known as Black Seminoles, but others, these are the descendants I've been uh, invoking throughout this presentation, went to Red Bays in the British Bahamas. Uh, Ross and Howard, who you met earlier in this presentation, uh, had done ethnographic work with a group that was known as the Black Seminoles of the Bahamas. Uh, they were promised at the Apalachicola River that if they fought with the British, they'd be allowed to live in British lands in freedom. Edward Nichols' promise was fulfilled on Andros Island in the British Bahamas. They were allowed to live in freedom in the Bahamas, and one of the main communities was Red Bays. Or one of the things Rosalind Howard was able to find, uh, we know hundreds were captured. And there's lists of those. And you see here something she was able to connect. Uh, you see with the blue arrows, two names. She also has the names of those who arrived in the British Bahamas in 1821, a letter that was uh, written in 1828, uh, what was referred to as four Negroes uh, in 1821. And two of the names are there. They had escaped after being captured and got to Andros Island. It's as good of evidence as one could ever hope for. And just like we we're so lucky uh, and so blessed to have the support that allows through the excavation, this uh, archival information really hones in on it. Uh, Rosen Howard did uh, work with the elders at Red Bays who had been passionately interested in the story of the ancestors. They knew the ancestors come from Florida. They knew Tampa Bay was part of the history. The Reverend Barton, uh, Ms. Marshall, knew of that passed down over generations. They just didn't have the specifics of where it was. And so there was a lot of rejoicing in being able to tell them specific aspects of the history of the ancestors and their tremendous courage in fight, fighting for their freedom so their descendants could live in liberty. And that energy came together thanks to Daphne Towns, uh, who happened to be a Brayton resident who one day was walking by the Manti Mineral Springs Park and saw the heritage interpretation sign we had put up and noticed this Andros Island and contacted me and others and awfully organized a festival that she referred to as Black Back to Angola in the summer, July of 2018. She brought her family members and neighbors from Red Bays to come to eat, to celebrate. We shared our scholarship. There's a research team in the bottom right. And they had a Junkaroo band uh, that uh, helped to kind of celebrate what uh, Harold Tripp referred to as the shared history of Brayton and the Bahamas with tremendous joy. There was a second Back to Angola festival in July of 2019. Uh, of course, the pandemic prevented us from having another one in 2020. Uh, the hope is that this will be an annual event once we get through their current uh, uh, health challenges. We have, thanks to this work, again, ongoing work, gone from what was in the late 20th century, just a legend of freedom seeking people being in Tampa Bay to a history that starts at Fort Merze, goes to Prospect Bluff, includes Swanee, and has some tremendous amount of specificities. And from objects that we excavated to the people. We have the names and we try to say their names as we do this research to remember them from those who were captured. And that's some of the names you see there of Sarah, Lewis, Nancy, Manuel, Cato, Hannah, of others who we know from the British Bahamas, Scipio and Cyrus. And in trying to make sense of people we refer to as Black Seminoles, if they were at Angola as well, whether Abraham, who might have been born in 1787, might have been here, at least visited. John Horse might have been a young child at Angola. Louis uh, Fabio, who of course was uh, born in uh, St. Augustine, ends up in the 1820s by Sarasota Bay and may have been part of this as well, that we can actually see them as well as think about these people's history 
we have now recovered. We've tried to do a tremendous amount to make sure the public knows about this. That commitment to the community engagement continues on, uh, right? The Back to Angola Festival, the Network to Freedom designation, uh, expansion that occurred, another festival, the excavations, the lab work, the exhibit that's now at Reflections of Manatee and what I'm setting up for the Ringling Museum of Art is all part of this recent process that was still ongoing. And as I started today's talk, I find what was a tremendously inspiring. A dozen years ago, going there with my children and thinking about those courageous individuals uh, has always been tremendously meaningful. And with this endeavor, we've had, of course, research reports and conference papers. We've had essays. We've had several documentaries made a tremendous number of media accounts, whether it's TV, uh, magazine, newspapers, and so on. But we've also had folk singers. Uh, there's one there by James Hawkins in the middle, uh, a song of freedom, uh, video games, the uh, Cesar de Bay Rancho video game connects up with the Angola, lots of kids programs. In the bottom, you see my kids and some of the programs we've done by the Public Archaeology Lab. We put up those heritage interpretation signs. We've led tours galore and Visit Florida includes coming to uh, see finding African-American history in Florida's Angola community as a tourist location, right? This is that, again, that community part and it just keeps on rippling and rippling like, uh, uh, like uh, ripples across a pond and hopefully even more people get inspired by this history, by the endeavor, and what we refer to as the spirit of Angola that lives on today. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate your attention to this presentation. Uzi, we want to thank you very much. That was very informative, and I'm sure we have some questions. Uh, you can unmute yourself if you have a question and just uh, ask, and uh, we'll continue. If you have any ideas about metal wiring or why you'd have a well by a spring, I am more than happy to listen. And if you know what that G-shaped ornament is, I'll be even happier. <laughs> We, we, we can use that as name that uh, artifact, the next you, I, I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well by water is tricky. Maybe processing for acorns or something. I have no uh. idea, but <laughs> something <laughs> brush the tannins off. Um, but fantastic presentation, Uzi. And I think most know I could just take up the night with billions of questions. So I'll just say, you know, this has been quite a year and the kind of work you do, how has that marinated over 2021 and, um, and such a touchstone for Black Lives Matter and then being in this health um, vacuum and being a fabulous public archaeologist that you are. What has this year been like? What have you been able to incubate? And what what meanings do you have from this year that um, could inform how we're starting to process, hopefully, what is getting to be the near end of it, we hope. <laughs> I think that, yeah, I think, you know, uh, at my age, I thought, wondering, wow, that was a lot of things that all came together all at once. Uh, right, I have absolutely no doubt uh, that uh, much of the fervor uh, that allowed us to have support has a lot to do with that vast civil rights movement that occurred in 2020. Uh, I, I would not have uh, thought to do those videos and all the online things, which I know you, you've been great at and other folks in the FPAN. I just never imagined putting my face on a screen <laughs> until I had to, because my job required it. And then I realized, well, let's start using that. Let's, uh, right again, I, I think about my kids who are obviously teenagers now, but 
I uh, don't follow social, my social media, <laughs> don't watch any of my talks, so they don't know what they're being talked about. Uh, they're always on screen, it's aggravating as anything, but it's also the reality that we can share so much more if we put things over the air. Uh, I was trained in anthropology uh, to really confront racism, right? The kind of really uh, the Boazian notion uh, that our task as American anthropologists is really confront sexism and racism. And so my research has always been there, but then that real powerful voices that said, no, no, say it loud, right? Not to just assume people knew, but to say it clearly and to really work closely with the African-American communities, to work with the descendant communities. Uh, Daphne Towns was there at the excavations all the time. Uh, another descendant who just happened to also have been trained in archeology span came down from Atlanta and worked with us and it was tremendously meaningful. Uh, he, Jason got overwhelmed at times when he realized what he was touching right, for the first time in 200 years, his great, great grandparents had been there. Uh, and of course that was tremendously moving for me to think about and to recognize the, just the courage and uh, the strength of fighting, fighting for freedom. And it also awakened uh, myself. I, I, I've always used the name Uzi Baram. I've never hidden where I was from. It's a, I think most of you probably realize it's a very distinctive Israeli name. Uh, I've always been a practicing Jew, but throughout my training, that was always separate. Something I just didn't talk about. Uh, students saw that I didn't teach on certain days and frankly, they were glad not to go to class and they didn't ask but it was always the Jewish high holidays and Passover would take off. And it just wasn't part of it. And it was a, a Baptist minister early on in this project who had invited me to give a talk on Angolans before we knew too much, uh, the week before Passover. And after I gave what we knew at the time, and she said, why didn't you talk about the Exodus story? And I was like, yikes. Yeah, she had chosen the timing before Passover. I didn't connect it. And Daphne Towns actually even more significantly laid that out and that that was an important part. So I was able to, in a sense, as much as I like decentering myself uh, in my research, I was forced to confront myself and realize how much of this is that common heritage of fighting for freedom. Because every year I think about when I was a slave in Egypt. And here we have, again, a story of people enslaved, liberating themselves, but what an endeavor from Georgia down through the Gulf, all the way to the Bahamas and being successful in it. So yeah, it's a really powerful set of dynamics. I hope we keep going with that powerful sen sense of the spirit. Well, thank you. And I love seeing the pictures of your kids too, their own <laughs> sort of visual. <laughs> we, we want to see your cat. He, yeah. he seems to have left me. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's heard some of this talk before. <laughs> I have I have a couple of questions. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, first of all, could you say again how long you think the people were there at that location? Yep. So, from the evidence and the modeling, uh, what we the the kind of view is now that. Starting in the 1770s, a community started developing. Uh, around that time, fisher folk from Havana started coming to the Florida Gulf Coast to create fisheries, what's known as the rancho in fishing industry. Uh, we know a bit about them, uh, particularly John Worth at the University of West Florida has done some fantastic studies of them. We know mostly from Charlotte Harbor, but elsewhere as well. And these Cuban fishermen came because you know the Spanish Empire was a Catholic empire. They needed lots of fish for the, to clear on Lent. And the fisheries of the Sarasota Bay, Tampa Bay, et cetera, which are so rich in fish. And it seems some Maroons came and started settling in what had been a pre-Columbian, the ruins of a pre-Columbian Native American village right by the Manatee Mineral Spring. Manatee River before it was dammed up, was, went 60 miles inland. Uh, the spring provides a fresh water. There's good hammocks for agriculture. 
And there probably was a small community there because when we get to 1812, we start seeing this place enter the archival record. That's Cantor Brown's work. And so Cantor always started the history with 1812. And so as the anthropologist said, well, why'd they go there? And he said, I don't know, because <laughs> the archives didn't say. Uh, so we assume it was there and the archeological evidence, there's ceramics that date from that time period. And then there are these big pulses of people with the battles up north. 1821 is destroyed. And it seems like it's a pretty thorough destruction of the community. During the Third Seminole War, uh, the Seminoles and Black Seminoles attacked Manatee and Bradenton pretty fiercely. And I've interpreted that as they remembered. They remembered what was there. And they were quite upset about the plantations that were built over this land of freedom. So 1770-1821. And so do you think, this is my follow-up question then, what about cemeteries? Uh, yeah, I, you know, of course, as we were doing the excavations, I connected with the Seminole Tribe of Florida, with their uh, shipo to, to, uh, tipo to make sure. Uh, we don't know where the people are buried. We just don't have a sense of it. Uh, again, the, the, the little bit we have in the historic record, that slave raid claimed they captured 300 and killed others. Uh, we don't know what happened to those. Uh, we excavated, although it was, for me, it was a large scale excavation. Uh, we didn't do everything. And that particular place by the spring would, you know, I, I you know, made sure I did my due diligence, but I could not imagine burying people near a freshwater spring when there was land everywhere else. So why would they be there? Uh, we just don't know where the deceased were. Thank you. So no comments on the well, on the metal, or the G-shaped ornament. Bummer. <laughs> hi, hi, I don't have anything on that. Um, okay. I'm a new member of the group. I am, my name is Payson Tilden, and I'm the new museum director of the Jimenez Spatio House in St. Augustine. And was uh, coincidentally, we have been this week exactly um, reviewing the life of Louis uh, Faccio um, Pacheco, I believe it is. And so I was fascinated to hear <laughs> what you had to say. We are trying to trace his entire life because it is absolutely fascinating and is very closely associated with the Faccio family. And so, um, our archivist is Tareen uh, Rodriguez Boet, and she is doing this study. And I would love to know if, if there are particular uh, parts of his life when he was there in Tampa that you may have that I could share with her. In fact, uh, years ago, a really bright uh, new college student, uh, new college is uh, the Honors College for the state of Florida. Uh, we get really bright students. Uh, some of them have a little bit of a rough time when these students because they are sometimes too bright uh, and work too hard. Uh, but uh, Elizabeth Usherwood did an honors thesis on him and focused on what we know archivally because he escapes from St. Augustine and he's at a rancho on Sarasota Bay. Mm -hmm. And then in 1835, uh, William Bunce, who's another rancher owner, transfers him, the terminology is quite strange, to Major Dade at Fort Brooke, it's now Tampa. And although Dade has already taken his hundred men marching towards Fort King in what's now Ocala, uh, Lewis joins them. And then there's the famous, uh, infamous Dade ambush and all but three members of that military brigade are killed. One who survives is Lewis, mm -hmm. who ends up staying with the Seminoles until he's put on the trail of tears. Yes. And so, you know, my question was always, and what Elizabeth was good about looking at, it, like, why, why would he come to Sarasota Bay of all places? And the inference, it's just an inference, is that Angola might have been well-known among the people of African descent across the region. 
And uh, as you know, by the time he hit 1896, in his old age, that famous newspaper story, uh, he's lived really an incredible life. Mm -hmm. and, uh, a major figure in Florida history. But yeah, I'm assuming he knew multiple languages and was a good interpreter for a major date. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, that question of why Sarasota Bay? Why was, why did he get to that rancho? That's and, interesting. Uh, yeah, I think Thank Angola you. is part of that. Thank you. Yeah, I think that to a great extent, right? Uh, uh, yeah, if you're new to the area, Florida history is fascinating. <laughs> I'm a native Floridian. Oh, you but, are, okay, so that's yes. not a... <laughs> yeah, but, I, I, yeah, I my great-grandmother was... was born here and lived here oh. in St. Augustine, but this is the first time I've had the joy of living in St. Augustine, and I'm enjoying it very much. Yeah, yeah no, you know, I've often, I've, I've met the son of Dewey Dye Jr. and some of his, uh, some of Dewey Dye's uh, colleagues, and no one can quite tell me why he knew about this. You know, I, I look at that uh, lawyer whose father was a lawyer, his father was also a Florida politician. Uh, and he was interested in military history and naval history and that, that you know, that's fine. Uh, but he also seemed to have known that that land claim was something, part of something much bigger. I didn't dismiss it at all. Uh, I don't think I would have noticed it are you going through land claims? But he saw that just Angola by, Oist, by the Oyster River. He confirmed the Oyster River was what's now the Manatee River. And he knew that was part of Black history. And he told people and he gave a speech on it. He might have spoken elsewhere about it, but we only had one speech. And Kendra Brown found out about it, connected with him, and then Vicki Oldham, right? It's I, that term I used earlier, a thender, a slender read. And, and this, you know, if uh, Sarah Miller is still on the line, and all this is going to be wiped away by rising sea levels. All right, so we really do need to get this right now so it doesn't disappear. Because if we didn't have the evidence that's now sitting in the public archaeology lab, uh, I don't think anyone would believe that there were maybe up to 700 people by the Manatee River in 1821. I think it would just sound too fantastic but uh, the evidence is there and the more who know it, the better. Okay, Uzi, we wanna thank you again. You did a great job. And I'm sure there'd be a lot, a lot of visitors going down that neck of the woods to check things out in the future. Let me, uh, let me just go back to the name that artifact screen and see how we're doing. Okay, any, anyone want to venture a guess? Part of a boat, the boat. Part, part of a boat. From Which, Crescent Beach. <laughs> ah, the Crescent Beach boat. Hang on a minute here. Who said that? That was Suzanne. Suzanne. Hang on a minute. Let's take a look at what really looks like. That's the boat. I know some of you folks have probably uh, read about that in the paper. Some of you have gone down and actually helped dig. I think, Nick, are you on? I know Nick was down there and the uh, Courtney. Marsha, you too? Yeah, that's how it looks in the sand. And I guess uh, right now it's covered up again. And uh, we'll get, I guess we got to wait for the next storm to get it uncovered. Very good, Suzanne, excellent. Okay, uh, let me just again remind you of the 29th. Anyone interested, get a hold of Robbie. Uh, we'll send something out, but um, you should have her email address. Uh, some people joined us later and uh, we are recording it. It should be on YouTube in a couple of weeks, a couple of days, I should say. So if you missed a part of it or you want to take a look at it again, the, the entire meeting will be on. And I just want to remind everyone that uh, next meeting, again, will be a Zoom meeting and will be on the 2nd of November. So with that, we will say goodbye and we'll uh, see you either on the 29th or on the 2nd. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye. Thank you.